Okay. So I've got an important definition of an entrepreneur as taken from a chapter in the book, The Invention of Enterprise. And this chapter is written by Bauble and Strong. Okay. So we, we're using the definition of entrepreneur as follows. One who undertakes some economic activity on her own initiative on the basis of alert observation of an opportunity to enhance her either wealth or power or prestige, maybe all of those things, right? Okay, so uh, right away, again, I like us to always kind of question things, question assumptions, and so when we look at this definition, uh, is there anything that we say, um, you know, could there be other definitions of entrepreneurship? We talked about them the other day. Uh, are wealth, power, and prestige the only things that would cause someone to undertake an economic activity uh, that, that poses an opportunity? No. Well, it might be other reasons. Charity. What did you say? Charity. Okay, charity. What is somebody else? Pretty much the same thing. I said to help others. Okay, to help others. Um, and what if, uh, is, is that the only thing, just to, to help others? What other reasons might there be? Just for self-satisfaction. Okay, what about self-satisfaction? Just simply self-satisfaction. And maybe, maybe indirectly as a result of that, maybe you amass some wealth, um, some power, some prestige, help others. Maybe all those follow from that. Um, and it's difficult to say whether or not it's more likely the case that more often entrepreneurs are seeking self-satisfaction as opposed to wealth, right? We don't really know. Um, people are different. But uh, you can certainly say that some people do things if, if for no other reason than self-satisfaction. What, what is that similar to what we talked about the other day? What, what's one reason to start your own business? Control your own destiny. Control your own destiny. Um, independence, right? Um, so there's some flexibility in that. So you can say self-satisfaction derives from that. But so we're just going to go with, uh, with this. You're looking to um, create wealth or power or prestige. What is, what is prestige? Stature. Okay, stature. A name for yourself. A name for yourself. Okay. Community standing. Community standing. All right. So now we have, uh, if this is an economic activity, does that mean necessarily that it's a business? in the sense that we associate with business. No. What, what other uh, entities or enterprises do some sort of economic function? Nonprofits. Okay, a nonprofit can perform an economic function, right? Just an exchange of goods and services would be a very basic definition of an economic function, right? Uh, what about other than a nonprofit or a for-profit? What else is there? Okay, uh, a PAC, a, a political action committee, right? Uh, so there could be, um, and that, that's tied to political motivation, right? So now we're talking politics. What about government? If we're talking politics, we might want to talk about government. Does government exist? Do they do any economic uh, undertakings? Tax. Okay, well, so taxes are collected. You know, what's done with those taxes? Transfer payments. Okay, so what are transfer payments? Like those, they transfer uh, tax money to uh, uh, households. Um, I forget the groups of it. I'm trying to think. Of yeah, we get Social Security is a form of transfer payment. Um, uh, welfare. So welfare is a form of transfer payment, right? So, and those are some services that government provides, right? Does government only provide those? What else does government provide that maybe might not even be that type of example? Maybe build roads. All right, build roads, infrastructure, physical infrastructure, capital investment, right? Um, military. Post office. Military, post office. These are all examples of, of services or goods that, or, or capital goods that government provides, right? And government is, is not uh, for profit or non profit, right? It's a, it's a different type of entity. Okay. So, this, the, then the idea that an entrepreneur does not necessarily have to choose the for-profit business route or the non-profit route could also be the government route, right? And in order to go the government route, 
in an entrepreneurial way, what are some options there might be through government? What could you be? You get like subsidized or something. Subsidies would be <clears throat> one. You could be like a, an alternative fuel producer. Okay, but still, that, that is a for-profit enterprise, right? Uh, what about if you're, say you're a, your, your job is in the government sector, you are in government. What are two major uh, groups of, of individuals that you could either be, this or that, in government? Yeah. What's that? Federal or state level? Okay, we have federal or state, even at those levels. What do we have? We have elected officials, yeah. right? And then we have appointed officials, right? So we have, we have bureaucratic type positions. Those are not elected, right? Then we also have elected officials, right? They're, they're different, but those are both avenues that you can uh, explore if you're interested. To, to, you could gain either wealth, power, or prestige, right? So entrepreneurship, we'll just argue, can take place <laughs> in any of these sectors, right? Or any of these types of uh, organizations of activity, right? Okay? All right, well, what we were just getting into the other day was public policy. And entrepreneurship. And then with public policy and entrepreneurship, our focus is going to be economic growth. <clears throat> what does economic growth come from? What is economic growth? Okay, creating value, value creation is economic growth. Increase in GDP. Okay, we can measure it by looking at increases in GDP over time, right? We have different ways to measure it. Uh, so what, what do we associate with economic growth? Say we have one area that is growing in an economic sense and another that is either staying the same or maybe falling. Increased demand. Okay, and what is what would that increased demand actually come from then? Yeah, the money that's available to the people. Okay, and, and how is that money available? Through job uh, creation. Job creation. Unemployment rate. Okay, uh, if we have a high unemployment rate, we have uh, probably less job creation, right? Losing jobs maybe. Um, so economic growth, we're, we're looking at um, value creation in an economy, right? And, and we're, we're going to talk about the source of that that derives from entrepreneurship and, and innovation, okay? So under entrepreneurship, There are two basic types. Replicative or replicative, where you're just repeating something that's already been done. Franchising would be an example of that. Or innovative. This uh, one book that we're going to use in this class is going to talk about uh, the author's belief that, that entrepreneurship is really just that innovative variety, right? And I usually argue that that's, that's not really true, right? There's also this replicative or replicative variety, right? So buying into a franchise is certainly entrepreneurial, it's certainly a risk that you undertake. Right? It's certainly because you see an opportunity. It just turns out that there's, there's more than one type of entrepreneurial endeavor. 
If we look at these two types there, uh, this uh, replicative versus innovative, what do we see in terms of economic growth? How do we uh, discuss these? When you open up like a, a new business, it creates a lot of jobs, which contribute to economic growth. Okay. But, uh, more tax revenues created because the business has to pay taxes on it. So. All right. Is that just under no. innovative or? It's under both. It's under both, right? Yeah. Uh, either a new business doesn't have to be, you know, a franchise. A new um, a new restaurant in town opens up that might have locations in, in 30 other states, right? Because we open one here, somebody opens one here. Um, it's still going to create those same things, right? There's going to be jobs, uh, this and that. But so, what? What would be different? What, what is a truly innovative economic endeavor? Well, for replicative entrepreneurship, you kind of argue that there's limited or not as much risk because it's already been proven that this brand of business can succeed in another market and you're just trying to add it to a different market. But the innovative business is kind of uncharted territory. Okay. The product or the service that you're trying to provide. Right. Okay, so it could be different degrees of risk between the two, right? We might argue that innovative might just be riskier, more risky than than replicative type businesses, which would make getting um, startup money more difficult because it's Okay. It be, might be harder than to find startup money for these innovative type endeavors. Yeah. Because they're not there's no real example. Uh, you have to do a really good job to convince somebody that, that there are examples that this is like, successful examples uh, that you can kind of use as a, as a model for this and, and convince people that works. This isn't the same, but it's similar. Mark, but the innovative side of it, is that strictly, does that strictly relate to like just new, I guess like new types of business altogether, would it just be like a locally owned company that provides the same service as a franchise? That's a good question. When we say innovative, um, do we do we restrict that to something that's completely new that didn't ever exist? Or is it something that's just new to this area? Right? Like a franchise could be new to this area, right? So and it could be either one. So what we're really trying to, what these authors are trying to do is, is look at undertakings throughout history, the difference being that uh, one type is truly creating something new, uh, path-breaking, that really changed the way something is done. The other is really just moving things around, right? Moving things around. Um, might even be just a redistribution. Okay? So, so, of the two, if we say uh, this replicative type is when you are redistributing an in innovative type. is when you're creating. So this, this over here, we could have creating going on with the replicative type. But on the innovative side, we're saying it's, it's almost exclusively just creating, okay? Creating something new. So what's an example of things throughout history, and we just use modern history, of, uh, of creative endeavors? And keep in mind, we're talking associated with economic growth. Microchip. Okay, the microchip. What has the microchip done that has contributed to economic growth? Computing easier. Okay, computing all across. How has that helped us? Create different, different industries. Okay, entire industries have emerged as a result of that, right? What on the, just in a basic way, what is what is computing with the power of microchips? What does it allow us to do today that we couldn't do just say 
we'll say 30 years ago. It connects the whole world together on a real-time basis. Okay, throughout this, uh, if we take this whole technology industry, the world is really connected, right? Anybody that's, that's connected via the World Wide Web has a computer using a chip, right? A certain processing speed is now connected. So information is flowing at a much quicker pace than it was just 30 years ago, right? Um, so let's look at that in terms of, uh, so we're talking economic growth. Let's just break this down to its simplest, uh, most easily to understand for us, and we'll take it to the individual level, and we'll take, think of ourselves. When you think of economic growth as it benefits you as an individual, and what is your purpose for here in this room? What are you trying to do? Okay, build your human capital. You're, you're pursuing an education to build your human capital for what purpose? Success. All right. And you, you came to college for what reason? What specific reason did somebody say was going to be a benefit, the main benefit of going to college? Get a job. Get a job. Get a job. Make some good money. Be happy. Provide for yourself, family, whatever it is. Right? Earn a living. That's it. So, how do computers specifically help you do that today, as opposed to how they did 30 years ago? Makes research easier. In what way does it make research easier? Access to information. Okay, suppose you want a job in Texas. Texas is a growing state. Uh, a lot of cities in Texas are doing really well in terms of economic growth. And you say, it should be easier to get a good job in Texas than maybe some other place. How are you going to look for a job in Texas? How do you do it? How? You go on the internet. Okay, you go on the internet, right? You knew it probably because you saw something on the internet. Now let's put ourselves 30 years ago. What is the, is there any risk involved with trying to pursue a job in Texas versus right here in, in Conway? Not as much now as there was back then. Not as much now as there was back then for what reason? Because, you, I mean, there wasn't a whole lot of ways to get in touch with unless you advanced to a company or you know, or knew somebody in Texas or drove to Texas and got a newspaper. Okay, drove to Texas, got a newspaper, maybe a library had a newspaper, right? And then, now you've got a newspaper, you've got a list of jobs, but uh, what else might you want to know before you just up and relocate to Texas to try to get a job before you actually have one? What is it like? What's it like in Texas? What's the cost of living in Texas? What's the housing market in Texas? Where can you live, right? Schools, what are schools like in Texas? You know, what part of Texas is a giant state, right? So with computers though, those questions are relatively easier to answer than they were 30 years ago, right? I mean, just think about the difference. Think about how much time would be expended 30 years ago to answer that question for yourself. Texas, and let's just say you don't know anybody in Texas. So you have to do all these things. Compared to today, it doesn't matter if you know anybody or not, right? You can get most of these questions answered and get a pretty good idea of, and you can see jobs, you can research the companies. So you said research, okay? So we all do a certain level of research for anything we're trying to figure out. And the fact is today, we can do a lot more research in a very, very short period of time, right? Does that help with economic growth? Okay, in what ways? Better informed like business decisions. Better informed business decisions? If you can do more what more in a certain period of time, then you can do more. Okay. So sort of the definition of efficiency, not only that that activity is costing less and getting more done, but now there is the opportunity cost also has been lowered. You can do more with your time that totally unrelated to that activity. Right? So you can be more things can be going on, yeah. Knowing more about the areas can help you corner a market easier by knowing what's going on. Okay, so if you really understand an area, the more quickly you can uh, become familiar with an area, and now we're looking at it in a market sense, say an entrepreneur looking to undertake an activity, the more familiar the entrepreneur is with the area, the more ideas are going to come about that might be, uh, the probability of them being successful is just higher, right? with more information available, more good information. And so we can also decipher uh, with careful uh, investigation between good information and bad information. 
right? There are many sources available for information, and if we're careful, we can kind of figure out on which topics one source might be better than another, right? So now let's bring this into um, back more strictly to entrepreneurship and innovation and, and trade or commerce, okay? One thing we said was, in order to understand this other market, Texas, if, if we don't know someone there, we've either got to travel there or, or somehow find a place that has a newspaper from there, and then that's only that much information. But so in terms of starting a business far away for, or engaging in activity with an individual far away, what type of risk is involved prior to internet? Okay, there's a lot of cost information that we could, we could uncover, right? Over time, a lot of innovations have, have occurred, not just in business itself, but also even in institutions and in, in the, way, uh, the way commerce happens that have kind of lowered the risk involved with trading in far and wide places, right? And so we're going to look at those a little bit as well. <coughs> Right now, let's focus on, we're going to say that entrepreneurship also can either be productive or unproductive. And when we say productive or unproductive, we mean for society. We don't mean that, that the entrepreneurship that one undertakes is either productive or unproductive for the individual. We're saying, we're taking it as a given that it's rewarding for the individual, all right, whatever activity it is. But then we're going to say, in terms of economic growth, some activities are productive and help create more economic growth. Other activities are unproductive or maybe even destructive. They either add nothing to economic growth or they might even take away from economic growth. Okay? So, what could examples, then what would be examples of productive entrepreneurship creating economic growth? <clears throat> creating a new industry that requires a lot of people to operate it just like he was talking about with the you know with the growth of Silicon Valley and stuff like that that was never there before okay we, we can we all pretty much agree that that the technology industry in Silicon Valley was a creation of new economic growth didn't exist before and also helped a lot of industries that have nothing to do with technology to be more productive, right? So a lot of economic growth took place. Uh, what about the Industrial Revolution? Okay, similar, similar type thing, right? Um, mechanization, uh, we can even go post-Industrial Revolution, talk about uh, what Ford Motor Company did with vehicles, right, the assembly line. So these types of things, they create more with less, right, which is more productive. And then more people can make more money, have a higher standard of living, that's economic growth. What would be an example of some entrepreneurial undertaking that is unproductive in terms of economic growth? But it's entrepreneurial. Like those infomercials with the 1-800 stuff that no one really buys? Okay, let's just think about that. Give me an example of an infomercial. Um, some, um, I can't think of any specifically. I don't buy anything off infomercial. <laughs> there's like hair scrunchy buns. Like there's these things where you can make buns in your hair. I mean, really, who's gonna buy that? Okay. Well, or do people buy them? Well, there's like uh, 
There's a commercial that has like this like basket around your neck and it says, wow, that was bad. Can you like to tell them that? Have you guys seen that? Yeah. Yes. Where they're like, there's like where you can go online and fill out surveys and tell them that there's bad ideas and that they shouldn't produce it. Okay. But the people who are going behind these projects, producing it and putting it out there, coming up with like, you know, a product and then it gets surveyed and it goes through this whole thing, they still wasted their time and their efforts and their money for people to fill out a survey and basically say it's a stupid idea. Okay. That's so, productive. Somebody is expending uh, a large sum of money, it would seem, if it actually got on TV, you saw it, right, uh, to determine whether or not something is a good or bad idea, right? So, somebody's doing that. Um, I guess one question and one way to look at this is, where did the money come from in order to do that? As far as it relates to whether it's productive or unproductive. Let's just say, let's go to an infomercial we're all probably familiar with that was wildly successful. Uh, it was that blanket. Um, yeah, what's it called? The Snuggie, all right, the Snuggie. Well, did the Snuggie make somebody some money? Yeah. Somebody. Did people buy the Snuggie? Yeah. A, a lot of people bought the Snuggie, right? It sold uh, wildly, right? So, what's the Snuggie innovative? Yeah. yeah. I like it with the holes in it. It was innovative. I mean, it's, a, it's coming up with like a simple idea. It's not just a blanket. You can, you know, drink your drink with a blanket on. The marketing was it. They took how people wore blankets before and just, you know, adapted it. Right, just right. It's innovative. Okay, so it was innovative. It right? seems a little redundant. It, it, it seems a little, right? It's simple, but it's still innovative, right? Uh, and a, a question for us right now is how much did, was it productive or unproductive, right? What did it, in terms of value creation, what, what did it do? Somebody made a profit. Sit at home and be more comfortable. Okay, it added to somebody's comfort, right? Perhaps they're in Maybe their energy bill went down. Maybe they're more likely to bundle up in the snuggie, right, and, and, and not turn up the heat. Maybe they like that better than, than the other types of blankets that were available at the time, right? Uh, well, maybe so. Who knows? If you're a resident of that little town in China where they produce them, okay. they have economic growth. It certainly created jobs somewhere. There is Somebody is willing and able to exchange dollars for that product, yeah. and there is literally a pretty large enterprise going on, at least that went on for a while, and it still does, they're, they're everywhere. Uh, so certainly that has increased the standard of living for, for some people, right, that are directly involved with that, and even indirectly involved, right? And then somebody got benefit from it, right? Somebody elected voluntarily to purchase this money, dollars exchanged for the product, and people were benefiting, right? Okay, so, so we still don't have a good example, really, of, of unproductive. I'm thinking of, like we were discussing last class, the Green Energy Initiative, where it's not necessarily efficient or productive from just a job standpoint or a profitability standpoint, but as a, as a, I guess as a community, we decide for the health of it. Okay. Like clean coal technology. Okay, so, so. Like, it's still, it's a little money, but for the environment. Okay, so, so talk about green energy initiatives. There's a real question. Are they efficient, right? Is, is some of the technology involved with green energy, whether it's ethanol, whether it's um, biodiesel, whether it's wind energy, whatever it might be, the infrastructure that goes into it, the capital investment, and then the, the energy return, right? Is it as good as, say, fossil fuel energy? Right. What's your question? I do my, uh projects on um, in environmental economics on ethanol 85 and it says that the net cost of producing ethanol 85 is actually exceeds like the net benefit and the only reason they're still creating it that the producers can stay afloat is because there's like subsidies that the government gives to put it but really it's costing more than what you're getting out of it and your miles per gallon are not nearly as good as you know fossil fuels and the fossil fuel producers are making money off the fossil fuels but the people that E85 producers aren't. Okay, so E85, so you did your... If, they, if the government wasn't subsidizing it, they wouldn't be making any money. Okay, all right, so... completely free market. So for E85, in, in the absence of the government subsidy, it wouldn't be a competitive uh, 
technology, competitive product, right? Because it's, it, it would cost, if we had to use it to fill up our tanks, had to use it, it would cost more than using this other fuel, the fossil fuel gasoline, right? Mm -hmm. So it's less productive just in that sense, which you're... I was just going to say, I think that's a, honestly a perfect example of being unproductive. Okay. Our company, I mean, our government is paying for something that's not going to go anywhere. Okay. Well, so it's more be, I mean, if you think about, you know, how you were saying that military could be an entrepreneur type uh, classification too. And I think a lot of people would be war that way. Okay. Right? Or at least conflicts and stuff that we get in that don't have a whole lot of, you know, bearing to us one way or the other. Okay. So could military conquest be another example of an unproductive type of, of endeavor? Right, Vietnam. Vietnam, okay, and we could look at different ones, right, and, and we could look throughout all of history, right, uh, why did some uh, empires try to conquer other empires, right, and, and was it actually productive or, or was it not? Uh, what happened to the Roman Empire over time? Too hard to govern. Uh, too hard to govern? They became too confident. A little too confident and Our eventually started overtaking. Okay, so eventually it, it kind of broke up, right? That was, that was what happened to the Roman Empire. So, and these are some good examples of, of these types of things where you are, there's certainly entrepreneurial endeavors taking place, right? But on balance, they might be unproductive for society. But we've got to really be um, tight in terms of our, our um, how we define that, unproductive for society, in those two examples, right? What does it actually mean? If we're talking about green energy and we're saying that it's not as efficient as fossil fuel diesel, and if, if studies have even shown that without subsidies, it wouldn't be able to compete with that. So just in a pure economic growth sense, what is it doing then to economic growth? If we're putting more and more money as a society through, if it's coming from a subsidy, it means our tax dollars are funding it, right? We're taking our money and it's being spent, some portion of it, on that industry. And if we're saying that that industry is unproductive, what's happening to our money? It's being wasted. Okay, we could say it's being wasted in that regard, right? They make an argument for that the reason they're subsidized is for obviously for environmental purposes, and they feel like it's worth spending the money on environmental purposes, even though it's hurting economic growth. Okay, so it depends on what you define as productive, too, or unproductive, like you were saying, because I mean, a lot of things are productive, but they just don't meet the <coughs> standard of productivity that people would like to see, I guess, for the investment. Okay, so let's say, what would, what would be a minimum standard of productivity for an investment? On average. The revenue exceeds the cost. Yeah. Okay, just, just a net gain, maybe? So with some of these, with the, with the green energy one, the study that you looked at, what is it saying about the, what is the net value? Negative, right? So it's negative. So it's a decrease in value, right, on balance. So, but what are some of the benefits of it? What are being purported as the benefits of green energy? Less greenhouse gas emissions are being okay. emitted. And the more that you practice green energy and stuff, the more affordable it will come in the future. You know, just like with anything else, when the technology is new, it's going to cost more. Yeah, but like if our focus is economic growth and we're just kind of like looking at it almost as like an accounting standpoint, aren't we? Like if we're saying that the revenue has to exceed the cost, then we're not, if that's our focus, then we're not looking at the trade-off. We're not looking at like a green environment. Okay. Or not true. Well, I just want to state that it is, it is the case that there is a trade-off between economic growth and environmental protection, all right, uh, per, to preserve our environment, right, versus to just grow exponentially, there is a trade-off there, right? I mean, we know that. Uh, I guess the question is, at what point do we forego the, the growth of an economy for the preservation of the environment? In this room, we're doing what we're doing. What is allowing us to do what we do? What is in this room that has anything to do with the environment? Lights. lights. How are these lights on right now? Power plants. Huh? Power plants. Power plants. 
Some power plant is sending electricity to this room. We've got a computer on over here. We've got a speaker system on. We've got an overhead projector on. We've got lights on. We've got another computer on that's recording this, right? So right now, we are using electricity in this room, right? We're also in a building. The outside temperature is somewhere around 45 degrees, right? Inside this building, it is not. It's 70 degrees, let's just assume, right? We're comfortable. We're able to think and talk, right? So this place is being heated right now. What's the source of these, would you imagine, in South Carolina? What are we using as, as our source? Coal. Well, of course it's electricity, but I mean, what is, how does electricity get generated? Usually it's coal-fired power plants in this part of the country, right? Other things could be natural gas, um, we could have hydroelectric power, those, those are pretty much the ways to so, But coal-fired power is pre predominantly the source in the entire United States, right? It is the, the majority of the power source for generating electric, electricity, right? Yeah. Um, isn't one of like, the bigger coal power plants about to be shut down over by, uh, I guess it would be the 501, because they have the big reservoir to, to the left, and then... Yeah. The, yeah. They're going to shut down that power plant. Um, not sure exactly what the reasons are that that's being shut down. But that was a coal-fired power plant. I think it was because they didn't have enough money. It wouldn't have been productive for them to do the um, the mission. Um, to bring it up the government standards. Okay. Yeah, bring up the government standards. Yeah. Okay, so to maintain emission standards. Right. All right. <clears throat> This company is not going to invest, this, this regulated electric utility is not going to invest in the, the physical capital to make sure that it meets the standards, right? So the alternative is to close down that power plant, right? And defer energy production to some other source, some other plant, or some other fuel source to continue to produce electricity, right? Um, so, so let's go back again to this trade-off. At what point? What happens if, if this plant is shut down, now another plant is going to have to take on, or maybe a bunch of different plants are going to have to take on, in terms of productivity, economic growth, what will it do to those other plants? Increase their demand. It's going to increase the demand on those plants. And their supply. All right, and their supply, right? So then, in terms of this one was closed down for, for maintenance, what's going to happen to a plant that what about its capacity? Plants have a certain capacity, right? What if we start shutting down plants and make fewer plants do more production with a growing population and possibly even a higher energy demand population? What happens to the existing plants? You get closer to capacity. Is, is there running at capacity or maybe even above capacity? Like I have some problems and prices okay. might go up. The prices will go up because, but why would the prices go up? What, what's going on now? One is that there's less competition will result from that, right? Yeah. And, and so, what is a, if you have a plant, right, a power plant, and now you're having to do more than you did before, what's one thing that's going to definitely be required to keep it going? You have to build a new one. But suppose you're not allowed to build a new one. So there's, it's, you're not able to build a new plant. You're closing one down. More labor, more um, products to keep the plant running at. Because more maintenance, right? So you're gonna, it's going to require more maintenance. The more something is used, a vehicle, whatever it is, let's just use something we all understand, a vehicle. If we're going to drive 50,000 miles a year as opposed to 10,000 miles a year, we know we're going to have to get the oil changed more often. We know we're going to have to change the tires more often. We know we're going to have to wash it more often, add um, the, the liquids to it more often, right? That's just going to be the case. Uh, and all the different uses of it are probably going to wear out a little faster, wear and tear on it. So the more you use something, the more that's going to be required, right? So, so in terms of productivity, we shut down a lot of plants and make existing plants do more. The maintenance requirement is going to go up on all of those plants, right? That's going to happen. So we do have to be cognizant as a society, you know, how much of a trade-off are we willing to undergo right? in terms of economic growth? versus preserving our environment, right? And that is a whole other debate for, for another class and another time. But uh, 
that, that trade-off is, is kind of there in the background as a societal question, right? The, the policy circles, they actually do debate, right? We know that. Um, we're going to hold it off for now and just look at productive versus unproductive. Okay, so we've, the two examples we've come up with so far are um, what we've used, subsidized industries that may not uh, be competitive without the subsidies, right? And we, we've also talked about military, right? Military conquest, right? So, uh, and, and we could talk about, there is a debate in policy circles for the United States, you know, where it should be, where it should not be militarily, right? And those are really difficult debates, okay? So let's go to an, maybe an easier uh, debate uh, for another part of the world where military conquest takes place and, and we can say, uh, can we say it's, it's either it's clearly unproductive? What, what could these be? What, what are what's the reason for some military conquest in some countries? Regime turnovers. All right, regime turnover. So we're talking. Let's let's talk about third world countries. Uh, regime turnover. What's going on all the time? And are these productive places? Is it's what's going on uh, is it contributing to economic growth? Standard livings are increasing as a result of. Like, what's a regime turnover look like? What, what, somebody said, draw me a picture of it. Tell a story. What's a regime turning? I think you overthrow a dictator. I mean. Okay, you overthrow a dictator. How often does it happen? Fairly often. It happens fairly often in, in, in third world countries, right? We know when we think of regime turnover and, and dictators being overthrown, we're not thinking of the United States or, or England, right? Not in the modern age. So we associate it with a certain part of the world where we, we know, without even reading about it, that it happens fairly often there, right? Certainly relative to here. What's accomplished as a result of that? Most of the time the countries have mass amounts of natural resources that they hopefully can utilize and you know, build a economic growth there as well. Okay. It'd be an asset. Sometimes it's because a lot of these countries sometimes tend to have a pretty sizable endowment of natural resources and different groups are fighting for the power to control those natural resources, right? Why isn't it adding to the to the productive capacity and increasing standard of living for the average citizen in many cases? Corruption. Corruption? Okay. So corruption. Let's talk about corruption as an example of entrepreneurial undertaking that let's just say is unproductive. What makes corruption First of all, what makes it entrepreneurial? You observe an opportunity. All right. Yeah, what's well. yeah, an example of a corrupt act? Bribery. Yeah. Bribery. Like anything that deals with the mob would be like an entrepreneurial type corruption. Okay. Okay. So, so certain types of corruption, uh, if we're going beyond the law, right, to the to the underground economy. We could get into another debate that we really don't want to go into right now, but we could go back to the Prohibition and we could talk about the Mafia back then, uh, certain parts of the Mafia that were involved in economic activity that previously actually wasn't illegal, right? Then it became illegal, and then corruption came in. How did, how did this activity that was previously legal then became illegal, and now corruption becomes associated with it? What was the corruption? Oh, the violence. Well, I mean, the demand for the product had already been established, so you making it illegal doesn't really nullify the demand. And okay. As long as the demand existed, people are willing to commit crimes to meet that demand. Okay. And, and so, what tax, was corruption? Tax-free liquor being sold and made. Okay. And how did? Where's the corruption? What, what do we say? What group? Like, payoffs uh, to government. Payoffs to who? To government. Okay. Usually, we associate corruption with government, right? Yeah. So. So in what way was government acting corrupt in the, the bootleg trade for liquor during the Prohibition? They would take like a cut or a percentage to kind of look the other way. Okay, right. So they were allowing this activity to go on, knowing that even though it was illegal, it was pretty much in our culture that we have a certain demand on average for alcohol, right? And this law was not going to change that. Now it's illegal. The trade itself becomes less productive than it was. Why? With regard to corruption. What's having to happen now? 
There's like so few suppliers now. I mean, there's a lot less suppliers, right? Because there's only so many people who are willing to try to do something that is going to be uncorrupt, illegal, right? Deal with the corruption practices that are going to be necessary in order to make sure that you are able to do this activity, right? So in terms of money, dollars spent, now we've got this illegal activity. And we can just imagine on our, on our financial statements that probably aren't made available for other people. We have two books. You know, they, they, they kept two books. <laughs> One of the books actually shows how many dollars are outlaid for corruption, right? Which is bribery, which is saying, you know, the, this police force, these judges, this, whatever, these officials, this is how much we pay them so that they don't shut us down, right? And then, in terms of whether that's productive or unproductive, right, it's certainly much more unproductive in that case than it was before, right? right. Because the jobs even that are in it. Today, you can work in the industry, you can get a job with who? Suppose you want to be in that industry. Anheuser-Busch, Anheuser all right? Great company in terms of economic uh, means, right? Probably got good benefits, good income, secure, good work environment, safe, right? You can sleep at night. You're, say you're just driving a, a truck for Anheuser-Busch, okay? What if you were driving a truck for the Mafia during the Prohibition? Would you have that same sense of security? No. Not in any way, right? So what would your personal life be like is the typical worker in this industry during the prohibition. A bit more stressful. A little bit more stressful, right? Yeah. Slightly. Dangerous. What's that? Dangerous. Dangerous. Of course it would be dangerous, right? So certainly unproductive relative to what it was before it was illegal, right? So that's just another example of, of unproductive activities. All right. The other type is just simply redistribute. Let's say that, uh, and, and here we get into lobbying. Uh, rent seeking. Right? And, and these are activities that certainly take place on a regular basis. Almost every industry today has lobbyists in some form or another working for them, right? Seeking either political favor in, in either a positive or negative way, either to stop one group from doing one thing or to encourage or help this group do something, right? That's lobbying uh, works to achieve that. Rent seeking simply means it's trying to obtain benefits for itself that it can't really obtain through the competitive marketplace. All right. So what would be an example of, um, let's, let's take an industry and in what ways does it actually use lobbying to generate favors for itself? Let's talk about, uh, yeah. Okay, the, the National Rifle Association with gun laws. Right. What is what does it spend a lot of money trying to do? Make sure that certain guns and things are legal and they lobby the government officials paying them off tons of money in order for them to <clears throat> vote their way. Okay, they're trying to preserve the legality of their whole uh, trade, right? The gun trade. Right? So and then individuals are trying to preserve their right to own a gun, right? Now, so we've got this under entrepreneurship, under the unproductive side, okay? So we're not saying that it's right or wrong, unproductive or productive, right? We're just saying it is, okay? So, so if we say it's unproductive to lobby for that, why is that unproductive? Better, well spent, you know, um, for 
something. Because they should vote on what's right instead of what somebody's paying to vote for. They should vote for the way they actually feel rather than, you know, what they're paid for or what they're, you know, I guess it's not really paid in a sense, but the perks and stuff that they get, just like with the petroleum industry and stuff like that, you know. Okay. What, in what kind of institutional environment would these lobbyists, so again, I said, I'm not going to say it's not right or not in their best interest to lobby. It certainly is if this whole industry is under attack, right? If they don't lobby, there's a good chance this industry might suffer a pretty significant blow, right? Lose a lot of money, and then individuals lose their right, possibly, to own a gun or certain guns or something like that, right? In what environment might this type of money not have to be expended in order to preserve that right? Say institutional. When I say institutional, um, uh, we're going to go into this in a minute. But under what set of set of laws or or um, constitutional arrangement would it be something that we just wouldn't have to worry about? And these companies wouldn't have to lobby to make sure that their right to be in existence actually is maintained. Congress, uh, actually, no, they wouldn't have any. <laughs> they wouldn't really have to because the country's not going to repeal the Second Amendment. Okay, we're talking about the Second Amendment, right? Yeah. Under, under the Bill of Rights. Right. There is a fear, obviously, from this lobbying group that, that it won't be preserved. But it's, it's a manufactured fear. Okay, it might be a manufactured fear, right? But there's certain aspects of it that they're really lobbying for more than anything else. Just like with the Brady Bill and stuff like that. You know, it's not the fact that they're wanting to take guns away from everybody in the country. You know, and that's not what the lobbyists are out there for. They're more lobbying for, you know, for the right that if you want to own an automatic or semi-automatic weapon that, you know, that you should be able to. And I think that's the, that's the difference with it, you know, is what you're, they're not, like he said, you don't have to worry about them you know, abolishing the, you know, the gun and arms industry in this country. What they want is, you know, certain aspects of that industry. So you don't have people going to the theater shooting the whole theater, you know, before okay. cops can respond. Okay. So there's, right now, though, we could argue there is a debate about the extent of the Second Amendment, right? Yeah. There, there could be a Supreme Court case about if something changes, right? Uh, you know, how how far does the Second Amendment go in guaranteeing your right to bear arms? Right, that could be debated. It could be uh, you can't own an automatic or semi-automatic weapon, right? Or some would argue uh, the right was preserved for state militias, and then others argue state militias is anybody, right? And others will argue no, it's not, right? And so, so there is a debate going on there. Right? The Second Amendment came to pass when people the uh, personal firearm was a musket, not when was AR-15. Okay, so there's a historical context of the Second Amendment for sure, yeah, right? And they also passed it so that like they could overtake the government if the government was doing wrong, so the citizens could have weapons to overtake the government, you know? Okay, so that it is related with um, if the government is not doing what you agree, you certainly have an overwhelming consensus, there is this right to sort of... The citizens will rise up. Right, okay, right. And, and there's, there's, there's historical context about that, right? But so what do we, let's not go into that discussion at all. What we want to get to is lobby, productive or unproductive. Are you trying to say like it would be unproductive if you have like a lobbyist going in, if like the Senate or House of Representatives was having a bill meeting about like, like let's say, I don't know, like animals, animal rights, okay? Like there's no point of having a lobbyist for the NRA representing right there, like in Congress, when they don't need to fight for anything at that moment. Are you saying that's unproductive? No. Or are you trying to say, like, if, like, I don't if, know if it was, that. say there was nothing to worry about for your industry, right? That as long as people demand your product and you're providing the service, you don't need to worry about that, right? Then you wouldn't need to lobby, yeah. okay? So the fact that many industries do need to lobby says something about our system, right? Our government system. There are different things that it says. In one case, it's that we do have this ability to review certain 
uh, fundamental rights, right? Review them and see have, have things change, right? And that takes place, right? And so that lobbying is going to happen. Other things, though, what are other reasons people lobby that are completely not near as controversial as the Second Amendment? I mean, sometimes the government seems to dictate to the public at large based on certain values, regardless of what the demand may be. Okay. Like in the instance of guns, there's a demand for those guns, or maybe in the instance of like alcohol, they might say they don't get alcohol. Like during the time when it was prohibited, it was like a value thing. All right. A certain, a certain, like the Catholic religion was like, okay, this is bad for people. And they okay. had a lot of influence with the government, but they decided to take an initiative to kind of. Okay, uh, that's a good example. All right, so values. So one group has certain values that they would say they don't want this to be the case. So they right? impose it on them. And they impose it on the population at large through lobbying, right? By getting government to either enact legislation. Right? Or, in other ways, it could be simply set aside dollars to encourage or discourage something, right? What would be, um, let's talk about subsidized industry. Let's talk about the housing industry. Home building is subsidized, right? Lobbying certainly takes place to encourage the home building industry. In what way? What are some favors through government that encourage the home building industry? Reduce like down payment, you don't have to like put a down payment on a loan now. If you have good credit, you can just you can get your home, you would just have to pay your mortgage. Okay, much lower down payment requirements to buy a home today than say in the nineteen thirties, yeah. right? Tax exemptions. There there are you can deduct the mortgage interest on your taxes, you can deduct the property taxes on your taxes, the interest rates are subsidized to a degree uh, through policy. And, and the fact that there's a 30-year term is even helped by, by government entities, right? Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, without them, it could be likely the case that you wouldn't have 30-year mortgages, because that's an extremely risky mortgage, right? 30-year contract with someone that they're going to continue paying you over a 30-year period of time, that's a risky contract to enter into. And it didn't used to actually exist prior to the 1930s. And then there were these enterprises that came into being to sort of guarantee that the risk would be reduced if banks entered into long-term mortgages, right? That's another example of lobbying, okay? Because a lot of individuals know that there will be, there's the potential for benefits that could help their industry. And so it might be worth hiring a lobbyist to go and try to get some favor for your industry. Productive or unproductive, that's what we want to pick up with next time and, and really make sure we come away with a, a solid understanding of that, okay? So, 12.05, I'm going to assign the reading and discussion post for Thursday, and so look for an email from me, and the readings will be on Blackboard with the discussion post. All right, thank you. He said that we don't, we do the online.